the victims have been bled red velvet along the black box. Bella Lagos is dead. And that, and that, and that. Oh man, I'm so good. <laughs> Milling all night long at Nocturne in my black straight jacket. Yeah, ah, uh, I was goth as hell. There was no other clique that would have me, and there was no goths in my high school. So by being the high school's only goth, it was like eh, no one had to beat me up. Lucifer. We're talking about the gothest spirit of all today, absinthe. Absinthe is the aphrodisiac of the cell. What is absinthe and will it make me trip balls? Fromer says it's illegal in the States because it makes you hallucinate and go crazy. It won't. So what you need to know about absinthe is it is a distilled high potency, high alcohol content spirit originated in Switzerland in the late 18th century in the Neuchâtel Canton that it rose to extreme prominence in the Belle Epoque uh, in France. I have been informed by my research assistant, Leandro, from uh, the Educated Barfly, whom you should most certainly check out and subscribe to. What a helpful guy he is to have around here in New Jersey. Absinthe is a distilled spirit that begins most of its life as a neutral spirit produced from grapes. Then it goes through a second maceration process where they are infusing into it, well certainly Grand Wormwood, uh, anise, fennel, and any number of other botanicals. And it tastes mostly like black uh, licorice, if you're not familiar with that. And it is bitter. A lot of people describe it as very bitter. I think probably some people have a hard time recognizing, you know, if you don't have a, a trained mouth, you might just get black licorice off of it, but there's a strong bitter component to it, which is why people add sugar to it a lot of times. The important thing to know about absinthe is that it was banned, and there's a lot of myths about it. So why was absinthe banned? It's obviously because it's a dangerous hallucinogenic drug, right? Well, that's not true at all. Absinthe <laughs> was banned uh, for a lot of the same reasons that cannabis was banned. Not that I partake of that either, but um, that basically some people, namely, if I'm from my readings, wine producers in France were very concerned about absinthe encroaching on their business. Absinthe got this reputation as being kind of a working man's drink in the Belle Epoque. Artists, the Impressionists in particular, factory workers, communists, <laughs> leftist ag agitators, Bolsheviks, would hang around in these cafes um, and sip their absinthe and discuss politics, much like actually 17th century uh, coffee houses of London. Uh, and, you know, usually the people in power get very concerned anytime working people have uh, managed to find leisure time to get around, sit around and discuss politics. So absinthe took on the specter of a demon to the powers that be in a couple of ways. One, it was at the center of this cafe life in the Belle Epoque where uh, people were discussing ideas that maybe the established powers that be weren't a fan of. And two, it was directly threatening the wine business, which is super important in France. Globally at that time, there was a growing temperance movement that maybe we should question our love of spiritus uh, and fermented drinks. And so wine producers got together and said, you know what we should do? I have an idea. Hear me out, guys. I got this plan. Oh, uh, yeah, I should do it in French. Hold on a second. Hear me out, guys. I have this plan. Uh, is that French? <laughs> German? <laughs> He's from Alsace Lorraine. I don't know. Socle <laughs> Blue, I have a plan. All we can do is we can hire. Now I'm basically doing French uh, a la Jean Cleese. I'm French. Why do you think I have this outrageous accent? They hired a guy by the name of Dr. Magnan who kind of did a bunch of bunk research. I think it's open to debate whether or not he believed in this or not. Like, was this dude just some street scientist maniac? Like, yes, I could definitely heal your swollen prostate with electrocution therapy. Absolutely. My own stools, sir, are perfect. They are gigantic and have no more odor than the hot biscuit. Oh, absolutely. You want me to study it? Right away. Or was he just a total charlatan who didn't believe in anything and was willing to do anything for money? Whatever. Came out with a bunch of research about uh, the hallucinogenic properties of absinthe, that it was making people go mad, that it was causing good, upstanding women to tear off their clothes and throw themselves to the ravages of dangerous, degenerate, impressionist artists in the streets of Paris. God forbid. You know, I am a bit of a watercolor uh, experimenter there, so. <laughs> they, they drummed up 
essentially a moral panic about absinthe, which is how actually America managed to outlaw alcohol as well by tying the consumption of alcohol to immigration. Just in case you were wondering about that, it's always been the same issue over here. And boom, we outlawed absinthe, and it was great. The wine companies were like, this was fucking brilliant, bro. We managed to outlaw our competition. Well, here's the thing. Absinthe, on its own, has no hallucinogenic properties. There is a, I would say psychoactive, but I'm not even sure that psychoactive is really the right term for thujone. It is a neuroreactive ingredient, if I'm not mistaken, is defined medically as a convulsant, which causes, in, in very large dosage, um, internal hemorrhaging, renal failure, and nerve damage. Presumably, if you were drinking it in that dosage, you would also be hallucinating, but like from alcohol poisoning, dehydration, and being on death's door. There is some truth that at the heyday of absence popularity, there were unscrupulous, um, you know, murderers <laughs> is the right term for people who sell poison, putting together bathtub absinthe with something to make it green. Apparently, frequently, copper, salts, heavy metals. I don't know if it's gonna make you hallucinate, but it's gonna f poison the shit out of you. It's really bad for you. So yeah, sure, 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 that's, that's true. That is certainly not an intended desired outcome of absinthe. Is there some version of this reality where absinthe is actually hallucinogen and you're getting duped by what's available on the market now? I guess, I don't, I don't know. Listen, you believe a thing, it's out there. Go find it. Why then does this myth persist? Well, one, it was banned and everybody assumes that if something was illegal for like forever, there must've been a dang good reason for it, but that's not true. Right? Like, what are the fucking health risks of weed? Eating potato chips? Like, that's been illegal forever, too. I'm gonna blame two pop cultural moments that happened to my in my formative years for making a lot of people who I think are about my age, or maybe a little younger, maybe a little older, from thinking that absinthe is hallucinogenic. One, the film From Hell came out. I suspect you enjoyed that. I must be cruel only to be kind, as the poet said. Although I would happily wallop you every time you chase the dragon. Okay, starring Johnny Depp as a detective investigating uh, the Jack the Ripper. Uh, he's a detective who smokes opium, okay, and uh, uses those opium dreams to see what's going on with the killer, okay? And then, and sometimes he drinks absinthe and also has crazy hallucinogenic dreams. Okay, so first off, I love that movie. It's not a good movie. It's just kind of an incoherent film, which is the main problem here. It doesn't really, it doesn't, it's not edited very well, okay? Two, he's not tripping on absinthe. If you pay attention, he is desperate to get opium in that movie, can't get his hands on opium, goes for laudanum, which is like over-the-counter disgusting pharmacy opium, and wants to mask the flavor of it to drink it, and he puts it in absinthe, okay? Now, I'm certain that somebody has told me that, no, no, laudanum plus absinthe, that's a hallucinogen. That's, no, that's not it. I mean, I do think that there is some truth to the fact that people drank laudanum in absinthe, because la absinthe tastes freaking strong, and if you're trying to hide something, that's going to be a great way to deliver poison to yourself or others. The other thing that happened, the music video for The Perfect Drug by Trent Reznor. That music video is so fucking sick! You ever watch pop-up video on VH1? It was always like the number three most expensive music video of all time. The arrow goes straight through my heart Without you everything just falls Mm, man, that song gets me so pumped up when he's electrocuting his brain in that crypt or whatever, and he's like hanging out with the wind machine, because you know, that's how that works, and he's got the coat and the hat and the uh, ah, vampire shit. Okay, absinthe. It does have a, some great pageantry in how it would be traditionally served. We're gonna do a little bit of that today. Uh, what it doesn't involve is fire. Just to address that really quickly, in the 90s, when all this goth stuff was going on, some Eastern European spirit producers uh, from Czechoslovakia, was it Czechoslovakia then or Czech Republic? I forget. Advertising campaign essentially came up with this idea of the bohemian preparation of absinthe. As far as I know, I could be wrong. I don't know what I don't know, but as far as I know, as far as I've read, uh, it was an ad campaign to just make it look cool, to set the sugar cube on fire and burn that into the absinthe, right? It's a high proof spirit. Why would you want to remove the alcohol content? I don't know. If you burn it, you're going to take all the alcohol out, okay? As far as I know, that is not a component 
of traditional Belle Epoque absinthe. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's just not part of it. It's certainly, if you like it that way, it's valid. Everything's valid. I'm just pointing out that that's not the right way to do your absinthe up. I have some absinthe glasses. These are pretty handy for doing absinthe. Um, it's got a reservoir at the bottom here and a bigger reservoir at the top. I don't know. Anyway, the idea is that you fill this bottom part with absinthe and then this is the right ratio of water to add. Handy things to have. You could get a gigantic and awesome, glorious crystal fountain with a Art Nouveau naked lady posing underneath it. Uh, my producer wouldn't let me. She said it was $200 and we didn't need to spend it. So we got this winky dinky little dripper guy that sits on top of the cup and uh, shakes the water down into it one drippy drip drop at a time. I have a few bottles of absinthe here I thought I would taste today. I'll give you some tasting notes on these. So why don't we start with Pernod? I wanna talk about Pernod for just a minute. Pernod is a brand. There is, in common parlance, a bottle of pastis that everybody calls Pernod. That is because when absinthe was outlawed, Pernod, the world's foremost producer of the largest amount of absinthe, stopped making absinthe and started making something that didn't have wormwood in it, made pastis. I think they dropped the proof a lot. My point is, is that this isn't that. It looks identical because the most prominent thing here is Pernod, but it says absinthe superior, okay? This is, according to Pernod, the same recipe that they were making in the 1890s. As I do not have access to the Pernod family vaults, I am incapable of contesting that argument. So we're going to have to take their word for it that this is the real deal, absinthe. I have a little absinthe spoon here. This is a thing called a balancier. Absinthe is very well known for this process of the loche. So when you add water to this, the oils come out of suspension and cloud up the whole thing, if I'm not mistaken. So it's going to turn an opalescent kind of opaque white, which is a really neat thing. And so that's why this process of slowly adding water to your absinthe is sort of fetishized. And the idea is that the water should be very cold. What's cool about this balancier is that you take this funnel up here and you put some ice in it. And I'm gonna make a joke now about like, and now what you're supposed to do is wait for it to melt. But that's nonsense, that's not what you're supposed to do at all. You're supposed to add water to it It's gonna do this thing where it kind of dances back and forth it's like one of those thirsty birds splattering water all over the place and drip drip dropping my water into my absinthe slowly, dissolving the sugar cube. The loche will unfold slowly. This was a $30 alternative to a $250 absinthe fountain. So you guys are just gonna have to put up with it, okay? And you can get one of these in the pinned comment below. Just for consistency's sake, I'm not gonna say that each one of these absinths needs a sugar cube or needs one sugar cube. I'm gonna do one sugar cube on each so that they are all tasted under the same conditions, okay? This is starting to turn opalescent. It almost looks, it does look illuminated because it's underlit, but even if it weren't, it would look luminescent slightly. Milky almost, but not quite. But that's about where we wanna to fill to. The next thing you would do is you would drop your spoon in and stir it up. Oh, this one to try and dissolve all that sugar. So the low share is pretty un dramatic. It's very clear, which I'm not used to with uh, most absinthe, or even this absinthe. I think that's got a lot to do with the fact that my bottle has lost a lot of its color to light pollution over the years. My understanding is that that shouldn't affect the flavor. I could be wrong on that, but Loche is a thing that absinthe fans rate absinthe on, so I would say that this one is unimpressive. But also that is subjective. Maybe I like the fact that this Loche is very, very subtle and clear. I could just decide that. That's nice. I like that. It is not overpowering or dominating. It's pretty sweet. I would say it's light. It has a pretty short evolution, to be honest, but as a something you might have in the afternoon, a uh, late lunch, day drinking drink, kind of slipping into night, this would be nice. I can imagine myself sitting um, at a cafe in Paris, getting ready to go home and change out of my brown sack suit and put on my coat and tails and top hat. All right, that's a pretty good one. I would say that one probably needs less water than the five to one, six to one ratio that this glass provides or is supposed to provide. I mean, I'm bad at this show, so I haven't exactly measured it, but I'm supposed to be five to one ratio. Let's do St. George. So St. George is an American absinthe that I know gets super high reviews. I've always had a bottle. I actually bought this bottle, not realizing that I still had a bottle. Okay, we fill the reservoir. Reservoir. Now let's see, this is a brand new absinthe. Okay, immediately the Loche is more impressive here. 
I mean, you're seeing gradation in color from the bottom to the top, where the top is getting exposed to more water than the bottom. They're not intermingling as rapidly. Tick, tick. It's very opalescent. It's very, very opaque. The green is going to fade over time, I imagine, until it's a very lightly green white. This is a much more um, traditional loche than uh, what I got from here, which I think is more desirable. However, it gives me less visual indicator as to when I've fully dissolved my sugar. Bottoms up. What do they say? How do you say bottoms up in French? Our césarite? That's not it. <laughs> That's great though. So for me, that's a weird squeak my voice does when I do that. But for me, I always think that aniseed and white chocolate kind of play on the same flavor profiles. When I say this means is, is somewhat chocolatey, I mean that. I mean like a white chocolate, I guess. But maybe there's anise a little bit in white chocolate. I don't know. What is white chocolate? Is it even chocolate? Probably not. Okay, so yeah, without a doubt, this is a much stronger flavor. Now I'm wondering if my Pernod has basically expired. I use this in my dasher all the time in cocktails and it comes through clear as a bell. So I'm, I'm hesitant to assume that. I think that this is just stronger stuff, which I've never considered before that there would be this much variation. But this really tastes very strongly of anise and um, fennel. Maybe there's like dill in there. So about wormwood what does wormwood taste like it's a bittering agent and as much as it has a taste i feel like if you think about the differences between um taste and the experiential nature of tasting i think wormwood is much more on the experiential side of taste they taste like burning when you ingest a bitter like something that is truly bitter your mouth puckers and tightens and draws in tight the flavor of wormwood the flavor of gentian is so much your physical reaction to it. There's a residual dryness occurring in my mouth. I feel like to me, and from what I have experienced of wormwood and things that are specifically wormwood in the past, that that is the effect of the wormwood. That it is, you know, make, it makes it feel like your mouth is getting dry. Get dry mouth. Okay, so we're gonna move on to Le Mousse Verte. So this is interesting stuff. So absinthe is susceptible to light damage, as you can see by my Pernod. And so they solved that by going with a utterly opaque bottle. The ticking of the Balancier is designed to make sure that you are aware of the hours of your life ticking away and that you are truly mortal and susceptible to the ravages of time and that life is but a joke played upon us by whatever powers must exist. So the Loche here, I would say, is fairly unpronounced. You get a much greater shift in color, clarity, and opacity, and, and everything. Of course, our Pernod has remained utterly clear. This is definitely more than enough. That is different. Oh, there's more citrus in that, for sure. I mean, there, not more citrus. There is citrus. There is a presence of citrus in this that I don't detect in these at all. I mean, the rest is basically absinthe, as we have established, but so far, this one's my favorite. It's definitely the most dynamic. It is more bitter as well. I would say that this one has a more lingering bitterness, more of a warm wormwood bite. Let's do the doc. There's a style of absinthe called red absinthe. It is the same as regular absinthe, but the final production of color is that it's red. A lot of those are very heavily dyed to get there, but Doc Herson's is all natural, and I thought it would be a really cool, since it was available at my liquor store, I was excited to test it out. We'll see how different it is. How are we doing with the Loche here now? This is interesting. I wonder if we're gonna get a very pronounced shift. It's certainly lighter, and it seems to be grabbing more light from the underlight. It's starting to turn a little opalescent. It's starting to turn a little bit opaque. Who has time for this shit? <laughs> So I would say the Loche here is really underwhelming, to be frank. Um, but I don't know that that matters. I think that the idea here is that this is a red absinthe. It's a different style. I mean, it's certainly pleasant, um, and it's certainly, you know, more pronounced than our Pernod. That is freaking weird. It tastes almost like whiskey. I mean, it's so not like the rest of these at all. Lemony. I mean, like tart, mild 
anise. I would say very little anise, in fact. You get an anise at the end there, but there is like a tart lemony thing that's going on there that um, I swear to God, really almost, it's hard to say it's the same spirit. That's different. Looking for an absinthe, I don't know that that's what I'm after, but it's cool. It's just different. Okay, okay. So I've run out of absinthe glasses. I ordered four of them online, but I do have one more bottle that I'm kind of, I really want to include in this episode because I'm curious about how it does. So what the heck, we'll just put it in this guy, right? That's fine. It doesn't matter. It don't matter. None of this matters. So we're going to pour about a one-parter here. Oh, and this is Leatherby Charred Oak Absinthe Bon. So it's absinthe, but it's been rested uh, or aged on charred oak, like a bourbon, which kind of makes it unique. It's different in the same way that this red absinthe is different. It's sort of outside of our normal absinthe stuff. So we're getting a pretty decent loche here, although the top is remaining very green, if you were looking at it very close. But the bottom is swelling with this luminescent, opalescent, absinthe loche. It's very pretty. This blue cloud all transitioning like by like ombre up to green here. This is beautiful. It's nice. That's nice. The sweetness of the sugar, of course, and the um, absinthe itself really marry well together. Similar to this one, I would say. Not so much this one, but th these two are pretty similar. It's, it's very mellow. It is not overpowering. It's, it's a, an assuming and, and nice afternoon tipple. White chocolatey kind of thing. Kind of citrusy, maybe. This is nice. This is probably my now my second favorite absinthe, I think, between the two. I will say, I don't know that I detect anything oaky or charred, but that's okay. I don't know how much that contributes to the process. I think it's just nice absinthe. This one is still my favorite, though. Nope, it's not. No, I think this is not my favorite, actually, yeah. That's fantastic. Leatherby, my fave. After work, we go out in the cafes and we uh, enjoy La Fille Verte, the green fairy, for L'Orgue Verte, the green hour. Yeah, I'm the green fairy. Today I drank five partial glasses of absinthe. Absinthe is pretty strong, so I'm fairly drunk. And before this, I had a whole martini. My barware is provided courtesy of Barfly. And if you want to use the tools I use, you should totally check them out. There's a link in the pinned comment below. Uh, and my wristware is provided courtesy of Crown and Caliber. Uh, if you're interested in watches, they are definitely worth a look. Oh. How to drink, show about making cocktails and how to drink them. And I am Greg and I'm on Twitter at how to drink. I'm on Instagram at how to drink. I am on Patreon at patreon.com slash how to drink. Thank you guys so much for checking out the show. I will see you next week with another episode of how to drink. Black on white translucent caves. Bella Lugosi's dead. The bats have left the bell tower. All the victims have been bled. Right, 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 right.